Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm going to turn you over to Frank, the director of the Cigar Theatre, to lead us up. So first of all, um, thank you all for coming and taking time out of your uh, busy lives. And it's snowing uh, on top of it in New York. Already it is an adventure to get anywhere. But uh, thank you for coming. And of course, I would like to welcome you know, our uh, 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 writers who came uh, from the Caribbean Sea. It took a very long journey. And um, so it's a very important program to us. The Siegel Center Bridges Academia and Professional Theater International and American Theater. And um, our uh, uh, mission really is to uh, connect, I think, New York City, which on one way is very global, and so many people, so many languages are spoken. On the other hand, it's sometimes a little bit local. Um, it's not as uh, uh, open and a variety on stages and languages and stories we see that reflect of the people who really are in the city. Over 50% in the New York City uh, uh, are, um, are not white people. We actually, you know, things have dramatically changed. It's not reflected uh, on the stages. So we try to do things that no one else does. And this is one of the things what we do here for the two days, and we're extremely proud to do that. But we also think it is of real importance. Um, Edouard Glisson was a scholar here at the Graduate Center, a very significant uh, uh, a member of the GC community, and his influence, his thinking, his writing um, is uh, uh, monumental. Unfortunately, I never met him, and um, but I, I think it's also in his spirit, in the ideas of the archipelagos, of the creole, of the, uh, the uh, to fight against the failure of imagination. What he said, lots of problems we have is we cannot imagine a different world. Plays, theater, and the stories we hear help us to imagine a different world, to make us comfortable with the future, or what already has happened because we are late. We just haven't realized how the world already is. Artists do see what's happening, but often also do look in the future and are a bit ahead, and they share with us what they see. This is what we do. And that region of the Caribbean is significant uh, for us. We have done many programs with Haiti after the earthquake. Others with the Judith Miller, who's with us here, knows that she helped us translate so many plays and works. We did uh, Jose Plia, voice here often, and, uh, and um, many, many, many writers, especially I think from Haiti. Uh, so we, we have a strong connection. We feel it's of significance. And also the Francophone world is uh, uh, of real significance for us. We have many French writers. But of course, the French-speaking Caribbean is such a significant, beautiful, and part of the world with uh, something to say. And perhaps we are not listening hard enough often you know, to what we do. We do here a big program. It's called Pen World Voices, plays from around the world. So we really have a history of, uh, uh, of um, intense uh, engagement uh, with uh, uh, work for the stage, with the written word also for the stage. And so for us to have those three countries, to have us all here is uh, fantastic. I would like to thank Stephanie for coming with us with the idea, she said, Frank, it's about time. We have to uh, do, uh, do something about this. i working on this. Is this a possibility? And she has come to us before where we worked you know, on, on programs. And of course, we said this is uh, something we would like to do. And uh, we would like to thank the French Cultural Services, you know, Nicole, who is a really, really a great worker in the vineyard of international theater, a little bit uh, hidden sometimes in the shadows or you don't see what she does, but she has made so many things possible, also this one. So we would like to thank your personal engagement, yeah. really, <laughs> as a person, but also, for, of course, for your institution. <laughs> and uh, people always think it's about institutions in a way it's true, but really it is about the people who are in the institutions. And you know that, someone leaves someplace and it changes. So Nicole, really thank you uh, uh, so much. And also the Seizure Company, and uh, who was there from the very, very beginning. And, uh, um, and so I would like to thank our advisory board, Michael, uh, who is up there, uh, who did brilliant work uh, to uh, give this uh, as his, in his function as the director, managing director of the Siegel Center, as well as uh, May Adra, who is uh, coordinating this event. And then we had an addition, a little bit late, we worked for a year and a half, almost two years on this project to make this happen. And then uh, Candace came on board and really, uh, we thought it would be important, but we had no idea how what really it was important until she came. And so uh, really, we're lucky to have you uh, with us. And, uh, and so that's a big, uh, a big asset. And we have learned a lot. I hope also for your role, it is as meaningful uh, what you did as a dramaturg, but also to put everything together. So I really would like to thank, say in the name of the Graduate Center CUNY, but also the Siegel Center and our PhD program, which is also a support of this. Thank you. And um, 
I'll let everybody else speak a bit more um, about the project, but I really would like you all to know that even though we are in a small community here, in the small churches, you know, which we believe in, and we say a small church in Finland might be closer to the gods and the big golden domes in Petersburg, and the same is true for theater. They are the big golden houses and they are full, but they're also the small ones, but they're influential, they're significant, and some people do come, so really thank you all for coming and taking your time, and it's a true honor for us at the Siegel Center to open uh, this uh, a, a day, and thanks also for Judas again for coming here, and uh, Andre Zachary is here, a great choreographer, and so many others, so thank you, but especially to the playwrights. But I now hand over the microphone to you. My last technical announcement is, if you have a cell phone, oh. take it out, <laughs> and let's see. It should be on off. And um, Stephanie. Merci. Ça marche? Uh, so my name is Stéphanie Berard, and I'm the curator of the ACT project. It is a very big pleasure for me to be uh, here today with, uh, with you and uh, to see the fulfillment of the project ACT, Action Caribbeenne Théâtrale, Caribbean Theatre Project, that was born more than two years ago uh, when we sat down with uh, Elvia Gutierrez, co-director of the CH company, sipping a glass of rum at sunset, <laughs> or walking on the black sand beach of uh, Trois Rivières in Guadeloupe at sunrise. I cannot remember if it was morning or, um, or evening. But anyway, we had this uh, question, how to make Caribbean theater travel outside the insular perimeter? How to connect it with neighboring islands and with the Americas? How to shift the past colonial east-west relationship and establish a present north-south axis. How to foresee a new emancipated relationship that will connect the Caribbean with the Americas, with the whole new world that shares a common historical legacy, that of colonialism and slavery, that of the encounter of multiple cultures, races, languages, that of creolisation, to quote Edouard Glissant, that of the two mondes. That was my goal, uh, my wish, my dream, when I started to conceive this project with Elvia. The key to open the doors <coughs> of the insular world would be languages. Translating the plays in, in other languages to allow them to travel and be heard, staged outside of their native islands. Having francophone and creolophone plays translated in English would give the text and their authors a visibility in North America, not only North America, but also in the whole anglophone world. That would also enable Caribbean dramatists to share, exchange their perspective with their American counterparts and open up a dialogue with an American audience to see how their plays are perceived and received outside the Caribbean. When I came with that proposal to have Caribbean plays translated in English and stage read at the Martin Siegel Theater about more than two years ago, Frank Enschker immediately jumped on board and has been since then a tremendous inspiring collaborator. Thank you, Frank, for inviting us in your theater. Frank mentioned Nicole Birman and uh, Laurent Clavel from the Cultural Services at the French Embassy, who also accepted right away to join the team. Without Nicole and her incredible professional network, but also her invaluable commitment and sense of organization and pragmatism, that project would not have been possible. So I want to thank all of you here. We created an advisory board Eight people that I want to acknowledge, they are on the program, I cannot name all of them, but some of them are here with us today. Amin Erfari, who is over here, <laughs> and uh, Christian Flo, who will, uh, will come from Buffalo, who selected six plays from, so eight people who selected six plays from Martinique, Guadeloupe, and Haiti, respecting a gender balance, allowing new dramatic voices to emerge, and especially women voices, 
as well as evaluating what place may resonate and impact the American world, the American society. These six plays have been translated by talented translators and will be stage read today and tomorrow by American directors and actors who will have the delicate task to give flesh and blood to the characters through the stage reading coordinated by Candice Thompson Zachary, our dedicated external artistic advisor, and thanks a lot, Candice, to be here. When Frank said we need a dramaturg, I was just, are you sure? And now I see that he was right. <laughs> we need a dramaturg, and you were an exceptional one. Thank you. ACT is, as you see, a huge collaborative project that gathered, I don't know, 30, 40 people to make the dream come true and build bridges between artists, languages, culture, thanks to theater. I want to thank all of these people who are part, who are part of the project and tell them how grateful I am to work with so talented and committed people. I'm now anxious to hear, to see, to taste, and savor the fruits of a very long harvest. But before we move on, I acknowledge also the Face Foundation in New York and Contexto Network in Paris for their precious support that made this project possible. And of course, all the Caribbean dramatists who are here with us today and the ones also who could not come to New York Guy Regis Junior from Haiti, who is the director of the Quatre Chemins Festival that takes place right now, has to be in Haiti. Uh, Jean-René Lemoyne, uh, Haitian living in Paris, uh, is currently in France because he has a production. And uh, Gaël Octavia um, was just part of a big literary festival in the Caribbean <laughs> and couldn't go to New York, you know, and, and escape from her work and her family. Uh, to be, to be here today and tomorrow, but we'll have a virtual presence, you'll see how. But we have you know, four of them today with us, Luc Saint-Éloi, who is here. <laughs> Char Charlotte Boimard and Magali Solinia, the authors of <laughs> The Day My Father Killed Me. Luc is the author of Street Stad, and Danieli Francisque, who is the author of She Devil. So they will be able to participate, of course, read, I mean, hear their work in English and see how it resonates in another language on a neighboring land and to enter in dialogue with you. So thanks for being here today. I know it's not easy to, uh, to come, especially with, a, with a, not a rainy day, but a snowy day. So thanks, thanks a lot for being here. I'm going to use this one. Good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. As we said, um, it's it was a great adventure so far, and I think it's the beginning of a very long adventure for many of the um, playwrights um, that have been involved in uh, the project. So I work for the uh, control services of the French Embassy here in New York. Um, we promote artists from, uh, from France or artists who are based in France. It doesn't mean that they are French. And as well as artists uh, from the Francophone countries and uh, in fact, uh, artists from the African continent. We promote um, their work here in the United States and in the field of uh, the performing arts, which is the field I'm, I'm work, working um, for. Um, in the specific field of um, playwrights and um, contemporary um, writing, we start uh, very at the beginning uh, with the translation of work. So this is phase one uh, of um, this, um, this long adventure, um, starting with um, these playwrights that gather emerging as well as established um, playwrights from Haiti, Guadeloupe and Martinique. And um, I won't say more, you're going to hear the, um, the word. I'm very happy to work with the team here and Candace and Stephanie and Frank and, and all the people who are involved in, uh, in the project. Um, my work after will be to 
keep on working with uh, the playwrights and um, presenters, American um, presenters, of course, scholars, to make sure that uh, the work circulate and one day um, maybe one, two productions here in the States. That's the work I do. Um, wish me good luck. <laughs> oh, and here is Candice. Elvia. Oh, Elvia, oh. sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon again. Okay. My name is Elvia Gutierrez, and I co-direct the Caribbean theater company Sillage, together with Gilbert Lemore, who cannot be here today as he's currently in Montreal. Allow me to tell you a few words about our company. Uh, Sillage is anchored geographically in Guadeloupe, and the theater we produce is deeply rooted in Caribbean oral tradition, drum music, and dance, while remaining open to regions of the world. We might find, where we might find affinity with our traditions and culture. Such was the case of our latest Guadeloupe Korea production, the play Le Sac de Lita. Rewriting the colonial legacy and interconnecting the different Caribbean zones while enhancing our cultural specificity is our goal. We work at connecting Caribbean theater with new audiences through multiple projects that include subtitled theater performances, educational workshops, bilingual anthologies of Francophone Caribbean theater translated in Spanish and English. The Project Act is part of this opening to the world, this interconnecting path that leads us today in New York after several years of work. I saw Act be born, develop wings, and then take off with Stephanie Berard. Well, that is a poetic vision. We know how much work it requires to achieve events of this caliber. And we also know how many committed people it takes. It is remarkable how Nicole Biermann from the French Embassy opened so many doors everywhere for this project. She simply seems to be in possession of the master key to all the relevant places. I also want to acknowledge the tremendous contribution of Frank Henschker in all his stuff in every aspect of this project. Not only the logistics, but also the conception in the human dimension. And our hope uh, is that ACT opens up a dialogue between the US and the Caribbean, not only today and tomorrow, but in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Candace Thompson Zachary. I'm a choreographer and cultural producer here in New York. Um, I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago, but I've been working in the US for about 14 years, and I've been instrumental in presenting and supporting uh, Caribbean dance in New York City. Um, and you know what I really saw in this project was a chance for Caribbean and Caribbean American performers, theater makers, producers, to have a dialogue that would not otherwise be possible. So the French Caribbean also being separated by the language barrier and by distance, having them come here, having the works be translated, and it was important to me that Caribbean American and Caribbean people in the field of arts and culture would have a connection to what was happening and would be able to be in dialogue with what was going on uh, with this project. So for me, the most important thing was creating those bridges, creating those, those conversations, and, and making sure that the playwrights were received and that the work really landed in New York, but also landed in the Caribbean American community here in New York. So creating that bridge was really um, my, my way of contributing to the project and making sure that, that it, the, it landed here and that it was able to make an impact. So. Um, I think that's all that we have for the panel. I want to just invite us to give them another round of applause for all of the work that they've done in putting this together. And I'm going to transition into our first event, which is a roundtable discussion on women and in Caribbean theater. So I'm going to invite our producers and presenters to switch spots um, with our panelists, who I'll invite to the stage. We have Amina Henry. We have Magalie Coleman Christopher, I have Romola Lucas, and Danielle Francisque, who is, um, 
whose work you'll see tomorrow. So, mm -hmm. and just a bit about how today will run. So we have this panel that's gonna happen now um, for about an hour. We'll take a short break. At four o'clock, we'll have our first stage reading, uh, which is Street Sad by Luke Santa Lua. That's um, directed by Paul Price. Another stage reading at 6 p.m. and another one at 8 p.m. So I'm really happy that this conversation gets to sort of inaugurate the event um, and especially kind of grounding the work that we'll see in the voices of women um, and in the work that women produce in this field. Um, we already talked about no cell phones on. I'm letting you know that we are live streaming. So say hello to the world. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's transition into our panel on women and in Caribbean theater. I think um, being charged with putting this together, like I was saying before, I really wanted to bring women practitioners who were from possibly different Caribbean backgrounds, either from the Caribbean or um, <coughs> related to the Caribbean through identity or through heritage, um, and allowing their individual stories and their individual perspectives to be the thing that was named in the room and that was brought to everyone's attention and put in place next to the other perspectives that were that are possible and that exist so that they can you know we can see them side by side they can talk to each other and that similarities or differences could be made visible um, and especially in receiving uh, the work especially of Danielli whose work will be seen it, you know it's a chance for you and the other playwrights that are here to see what your colleagues across the across the ocean are doing right so and a chance for us here to see how the kind of stories that we're telling in New York uh, about the Caribbean and how we're expressing Caribbean identity, how those relate to what people in the region are doing. So um, that was my, my main concern, my main goal with putting this together. So I think we'll start with you, Danielle, if that's okay. Um, yes, everyone should grab a mic. Uh, can you share with us a bit about your view on the role of women in Caribbean society and then how you take up those issues in your work. Thank you. Good evening, yeah. okay. <laughs> I'm very, very happy to be here and um, a little shy to be <laughs> to come for a tiny island and and uh, arrive here in a huge country <laughs> like uh, United States and it's uh, my second time here in United States my first time was this year in March in Miami where I, where I, I could uh, present another um, play right uh, with uh, Vanessa who is here who invited me in Miami um, I can tell you about my vision, my own vision about women uh, in Caribbean, in French Caribbean and Martinique Caribbean island. Um, what people say in, the, in, the, in, the, no, in our common uh, imagination is that women are a potomitant. A potomitant is a Creole expression to, to say that uh, women are central, are very central in their family. And, um, and, um, and that comes from, I think, if come from slavery on, or colonial uh, period. And uh, women are very important in, um, in their family. But in society, that's what, that is my vision, uh, we live in, in a very macho society where women don't really have the power Politic or economic power, they don't really have it, and um, and they they have um, s a lot uh, evolved. They they are they are changed since the the 30, 40 last years. They are uh, changed a lot, and uh, and they are doing for me a sort of revolution. <laughs> For me, <laughs> and um, what I um, observe are sp special issues that I observe is um, a sort of uh, a violence towards women, resistance of that wom women, 
uh, that always fight to get more, to get emancipated or not, not or everything, every, everyone. Um, and that violence uh, is directed to the body of the, the woman and their, and their power. And that's, uh, so uh, to explain you, I, I was born in Martinique and I grown up in Paris, in, in so Paris suburbs. So, uh, and I get, get back to Martinique to install in, in Martinique uh, 15 years ago. So I, 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 I lived in the country, but I also I have um, uh, a vision, a different vision that women who raised there. And uh, when I came back in Martinique, uh, that was shocking me that there were a lot of uh, men who killed their women. I, I found that very uh, shocking for me. And I was thinking a lot about that. Why uh, this violence towards women and to body, women's body? And that issue interests me particularly because myself, <laughs> I lived uh, violence uh, from my father. And this issue is very important for me. And uh, uh, another, um, and then in my work, I, 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 I excuse my English, but I do my best. <laughs> I get, it's good, okay. <laughs> so. In my work, I'm very interested in uh, this, this issue, the violence issue, and um, women power also. And uh, that's that because I, I and I raised in Paris, and I was a lot um, um, asking myself about my origins. Why was I French but black but not really French because the other French told me that you're not really French and when I was back in Martinique they told me that you're not really Martinican and I was between two cultures like that and who I am and that is the first question who, who, who uh, directed me to theater because in theater I, I was able, able to to um, think about that and write about that and tell about that. And the first play that uh, I, I, uh, I wrote was a, a play about slavery because I, I discovered this story in university. I was um, 19 when I discovered, really discovered about uh, slavery history because in France at that time, we didn't talk at all about slavery. And uh, it was very important for me to discover that because it was part, it was um, the central uh, question of my identity <laughs> and to understand why I became French, but why I'm not really French like the others. <laughs> And then uh, this, this was my pl first playwright. I didn't really know theater, but I wanted to, uh, are you, how you say that, scream. <laughs> I wanted to scream about who, was, who I am. And uh, that's how I wrote my first playwright, whose name is in Creole, Nek Pakamo, mm -hmm. whose mean, Nigger never die, Negro they never die. That come from a poem I discovered from a Martinican poet. And uh, um, in, the, in that playwright, um, I was, in that play, oui, d'accord. In that play, I was um, explaining or um, showing how we came in, uh, how we became, uh, slave, slaves and how things was happening on the plantations, mm -hmm. plantations, and um, I was very, um, and then I was directed for the first time by Luc Saint-Éloi, who's the man who ends, um, 
teached me theater the first time I went to, to on, this, on the stage is with him, and uh, I'm very, very happy for that, thank you. It gives a, a way for my life, uh, a sense to my life. And uh, I was very interested in that play about women rape. Because I was telling me that, in fact, uh, we are children of rape, women rape. Uh, a rape between Africa and Europe, and this is us. <laughs> and so I discovered it was very important for me. And um, the, second, the second play, his name is Hurricane. Uh, Hurricanes. Um, uh, I, I, I took about uh, 15 years to write that. It was very long, but it was important for me. It was telling, t talking about incest. Incest because I, I lived incest and I was really, it was in, in a, a, a big issue for me why things like that can happen and I was um, and I and I wrote a play about that and uh, because uh, we live also in a society where silence and uh, um, the power the, the 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 man power the father power is important and uh, and I was uh, wondering how can you uh, live after that? How can you resist to uh, uh, silence crime? You can talk about that. And this silence is important for me, li like in the slavery history, because it, they, this was silent too. Uh, the silence is very, very, very big issue. And where there is silence, I want to write words. <laughs> Daniele, so if I may, it seems like the basically theater for you was your way of exploring your identity, but also exploring all of these issues that women face in society that they can't talk about that. Yes. And this dichotomy between how much power they have in certain aspects and how much power they don't have in other ways. Mm -hmm. And the power, and basically theater was your way of maybe implementing change or starting change yes. or starting to change what those narratives were like. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A Does lot. anyone want to respond to any, she said a lot. <laughs> Does anyone want to respond to any of the, the points that she brought up? I think it's essential for theater to take its role in society as the promoter of change. Um, and your work is emblemic of that, the importance of that. Um, as a producer, as a writer, I am passionate about art and social change. And if you look at the heritage of theater among people of the diaspora, our plays are about change, mm -hmm. about keeping the stories alive and about change. And so you're keeping the heritage alive. That's my input. Um, so I'll see. Okay, so I'm the one non-theater person here. <laughs> um, so my experience is in film. Um, and I would say, you know, you know, you mentioned the providing a space for us to have a conversation, um, even across Anglo, Francophone, Caribbean, but film and, and theater. Um, so I'm from Guyana and you know, interestingly, the number one killer of women in Guyana is men. Mm. It's domestic violence. Mm. Um, so, you know, this is something that we're struggling with as well. And women, you know, in, as you said, in the family, they're, they're it. Mm -hmm. In society, they're made to feel less than who they are all the time. Um, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm a filmmaker myself, but I do curate um, films for various reasons. And in curating, I, I get the chance to see the types of stories filmmakers are telling about women um, and their role in society. And one thing I can say about filmmakers from the Caribbean is that they, the types of films, the types of stories that they choose to tell um, are kind of like the real, what it's really like to live in the Caribbean because 
images of the Caribbean that are projected to the world, white sand, <laughs> blue waters, glorious people smiling and having an amazing time. And it is that, it, there is no, it is that. But it's not, that's not all that it is. And filmmakers and, and, and um, playwrights, I think, um, that, that have come out of the Caribbean have like, really walked on, that, on the darker side of what it means um, to be Caribbean. And the stories that they tell, like really uh, they choose to, to tell stories that really highlight violence against women, violence against children, just what, you know, what the underbelly of all those years of colonialism has, has left. Basically all the things we don't want to, yes. we don't want to talk about, we don't want to say out loud. That silence. That silence. Yes. Um, well, Romole, let's, let's switch over to film <laughs> since, since we're there. Um, so maybe yeah, talk a little bit about what kind of interest women filmmakers in particular that you've seen, the kind of issues that they're taking up, and then possibly also what is the experience of women playwrights and women filmmakers? I mean, and you're a, a female curator, like, you know, what are those experiences like trying to get some of these stories to screens and stages? Well, so there, there's, so there's an interesting happening, thing happening in the, in the English-speaking Caribbean, and I'm not an expert on this, so <laughs> this is from my experience. Um, most, so starting from a, I would say, from an institutional level, m m most if not all of the film festivals are run by women in the Caribbean. All the ones that I can think about are run by women. And the, the film commissioners, the few places that have film commissioners, they're women. Wow. So, <laughs> um, no. So I, I think that you know there there isn't or from my experience there hasn't there is not an issue of representation or lack of representation of women in the in in, in the field um, on that level. Yeah. Um, then you come down to the actual the, the, the filmmakers, the directors, and the cinematographers and the editors and and all of those. So that's where you know there is more nuance or there is more variation in terms of representation of women. Um, a lot of um, there are a lot more, for example, women directors. Mm. Um, there are very few women cinematographers. Very few. And the ones that are, and the ones that are there are in high demand. Mm. Because women want women to work with to tell their stories. It's just, it's just this little community that, mm -hmm. that they're building. And then with editors even, editors are few. Like Women editors are also, you know, from what I've seen, there are not that many of them. Um, and then when women start to tell stories, the ones who are directors, the stories are usually very personal. Mm -hmm. um, and speak to, you know, they're, they're either very personal or they speak to, chil or t or they speak to children. Um, maybe they're teaching something, mm -hmm. or maybe they're telling stories from a child, you know, like involving the perspective of a child because they connect. Even if they don't have children, it, it doesn't matter. It's like, those are the types of stories that they tell, like stories that are heartwarming to children or, or maybe not. Um, and also stories that, that, that represent their personal, their personal journeys in life. Um, so they're very specific mm -hmm. in, in a lot of instances. Um, there are some women who make films that are more, you know, speak to a broader audience and are kind of commercial but they're in the minority. It's mostly like, it's mostly like women use film as, as, as a process. Um, like literally they're telling stories of a journey and they're, and they're that they're living mm -hmm. at the time that they're telling the story. Yeah. Is that Caribbean women or Caribbean and American women or both? Both. I, I mean, and it seems like a similar thing to what you expressed, Danielle, like using the process of making theater as a way to sort of like work through some of your own demons and work through some of the demons that we're facing in society. Yeah. Amina, you want to jump in? About facing my own and demons? <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> if you would like. Um, I mean, I think that's true. I was thinking about what you said, and I, I think that my work has become more and more personal the longer I have been a writer. Um, I don't know that my writing was particularly I mean, all of, all of my plays are about me on, on, on a certain level, but um, I think I'm more consciously attempting to, to kind of discover who I am, if you will, uh, 
the longer I'm, I'm a, the longer I'm writing, yeah. um, and sort of unpeeling that onion, uh, if you will, as a as a Jamaican American writer and what that means, um, because I feel like in the past several years I've tried to write plays that are really about being Jamaican, and in fact they're actually very American plays. Um, so I've, I've been interested in exploring that particular aspect of my identity. Yeah, I mean, there is, um, you know, a difference, I guess, in the, in the kind of work that someone who is living and working and born in the Caribbean might make and issues that someone who's Caribbean American might make. I don't know if those resonate with the kind of work that you do, like that difference or that dichotomy. Um, I, I think it co goes to a question of audience um, because uh, I know that I'm actually not, generally speaking, if, if my plays are produced or if I'm producing my play, um, I'm not speaking to a Caribbean audience. I'm speaking to a very American audience. Um, and so I'm very careful about what I choose to represent. Um, I, I think, I don't know that this is true of other Caribbean nations, but I know uh, in my experience growing up, whenever there was anything vaguely Jamaican, happening, it was a joke. Like, like everybody laughed, like it was comic relief, it was supposed to be funny. Um, and so I've been trying not to do that <laughs> uh, and have it and, and to present people who are actually people as opposed to um, kind of stereotypes of what you think of when you think of a Jamaican person. Yeah. Yeah. And it's addressing that issue of how we're represented in theater and film that inspired me to found Conchell Productions. Um, my company, we produce works written by Caribbean Americans, which is a challenge because every time the word Caribbean comes out, they think I'm talking about Caribbean writers. But I'm talking about Jamaicans, Haitians, Trinis, Guyanese, Martiniquez, people from Guadeloupe who live here. Their parents came here to give them opportunities. And yet, living here, they're not quite American. And when they go back home, they're not quite from Martinique, not quite from Guadeloupe. They're not quite from anywhere. So what is their story? And the honest portrayal of who these human beings are and who their family is, is what I'm looking for writers to put on the paper. And I've discovered that audiences care. If they're not segmenting you or you're a Caribbean writer, you're an American writer, you're a Guyanese American writer, you are a Trini American writer, you're telling this unique Jamaican American story or this unique Puerto Rican American story, or you're an American and you came, your parents came from Puerto Rico two generations ago and yet your perspective of the American experience is affected by your upbringing and your heritage. And it's, the, 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 as an artist, as a writer and an actor, I'm primarily a professional actor, I didn't feel welcome to express that and yet I was raised to express that. So I did, you know, and it took years of like overcoming the fear of rejection for me to say, I'm just gonna tell my story and if you don't think it's American enough, somebody else will. And it was my experience going to Great Britain and seeing the work of writers like Winston Pinoke, where she's writing about the British Jamaican. And these women, some of them speak with British accents, some of them speak with Jamaican accent, and they live in London. And I was like, you think like me? Oh my God. So it's seeing these women declaring, I am of two places, and my stories will be about people like me that made me think I'm not crazy by feeling that my story means something. And so this is a platform for people who are looking for an opportunity to say, I am t -t hyphenated, and you're gonna see it in my work. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and you produce a Hear Her Call Caribbean American Women's Theater Festival. Why did you single out the voices of women in that identity? We are a new company. We were founded in 2018. And I couldn't imagine having a company that didn't showcase the voice of the female writer. 
that's implausible to me. Um, we are silenced by other groups. I am showcasing women. And um, I feel blessed by the opportunity to show how we process the world via theatrical works. And last year was our, I mean this year, we're still in 2019. We had our first event this year and we had six amazing short plays by six amazing, completely different women. Um, a Haitian American writer, Dominican American writer, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Puerto Rican American writer, no, Cuban, ah, ah, okay, Cuban American writer, Trini American writer, and Jamaican American writer. Amazing pieces. And the audience was thrilled. And I knew I was starting something great. And this year we got, we're expanding to, we had a one day festival last year, and this year it's gonna be four days at York College in Jamaica, Queens. And I'm, I put out our submission yesterday because it was December 1st and a call for submissions to get these voices out there. And we also do a festival for, for men and women. It's the reading series that we are producing. It's all about money, quite frankly. <laughs> you know, it's all about starting somewhere. And um, we're gonna go far because the audiences are hungry and the artists are feeling empowered and I, 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 yeah, that's why. I'm a woman, I'm gonna showcase women first and foremost. I mean, I was gonna say, I do think that um, there's a way in which, uh, I mean, yes, others have silenced women, but I, when I think of Caribbean women or I think of Jamaican women and women in my own family, I think um, there's an element of, I know from me, that I've had to learn not to silence myself uh, because I feel like when, the way I was raised, if there's a man in the room, you're just kind of feeding them and kind of like, you know, <laughs> kind of like taking care of them um, because that's how you were raised to be. Even if you're a feminist, even if you're a very woke person, I find that I slip into this weird, did everybody eat kind of thing? Like if, <laughs> if, if like a man is in the room and it's just because of the way I was raised and how I was taught. Um, and I don't know that that's even necessarily a positive thing because I do think that I have a tendency to um, kind of dim myself in order for the men in the room to shine a little bit, um, which again, I don't know if this is a Jamaican thing or if this is just um, the women in my, <laughs> in my particular family. Um, but it's interesting to me that uh, when I was growing up, I, I didn't have any particular Jamaican role models, really, mm -hmm. in terms of literature um, at all. Uh, and I don't know that I even had any Caribbean role models in terms of literature. Uh, and that's something that, as I, as I get older, as I write more, I feel that I would like to be a role model for a younger Caribbean-American child. Like, oh, actually, look at this woman, and she's doing this thing that I could also do. I mean, I don't think I ever, I read, well, up in, I mean, I've read very few Jamaican playwrights. Um, I wasn't in, when I got to college. I read Michelle Cliff, uh, who's a Jamaican novel or was a Jamaican novelist, and that actually changed my life because I thought, oh my gosh, look, there's this woman who's writing this book, and she's Jamaican, and it's about and it's set in Jamaica, and how amazing! Uh, and it was such a breath of fresh air for me to not just be dealing with the black experience, which is significant and important, but actually a very specific Jamaican experience, which is slightly different. Um, and that's something that I've been excavating, excavating in my work quite a lot over the past several years, because um, being black growing up in America is a very specific thing. And, you're, and at least in the 80s, you weren't really allowed to, I'm black and actually, <laughs> like I have, I'm not just black, I have other things going on. Um, and so, I mean, like, uh, and being Jamaican, a Jamaican American black person is actually different than being a black American black person. Uh, and that's something I've, it's taken me up until now really to accept um, and not try to write plays for black people um, in the hopes that they will 
like what I write, um, yeah. because you, there everybody's different. It's like who knows what what people are coming into the room with. Um, but that's taken a long time of me being comfortable enough to be like, I'm just gonna write about my experience and I'm a black person and I'm a black woman and actually that's enough um, to just say that no matter what the play is about. You said that you would like to be a role model for uh, like, I guess other Caribbean American future playwrights or theater makers. What, what would you want to model for them? Like what did you think was missing in your experience? I think being brave enough to write about I mean, again, like my plays are not necessarily about my family and about my life necessarily, um, but being brave enough to write about yourself if you want to um, and know that your story, as specific as it is, is also universal. People will still enjoy it. It's not just about, this is what it is to be a Jamaican. That's actually, it's just, no, this is, this is my reality yeah. um, and I'm going to tell it and trust that other people will be there to receive it. Because um, yeah. I certainly thought that a lot of stories that actually are not universal were. Um, but actually, it was like Anne of Green Gables or whatever. Like, there, that's not, that's a very specific mm -hmm. story. It's not, oh, this is for everyone. <laughs> like, um, but your human plays themes. can be for there's, everyone yeah. too. You um, being, being comfortable with, I guess, like declaring that difference. But knowing that that difference is also in a way universal because we all have these individual perspectives. Right, and not feeling about. like you have to apologize for... Right, for that difference. ...where you come from. Yeah. Other people want to I don't to think it's a difference, that? it's a specificity. Because when you use the word different, it's, it, it seems to negate the, 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 the beauty. Specificity is what gives us our humanity. We can't be a blob of people. No one is a blob. We're each unique beings, and our unique stories don't belong under a label that is defined by pigmentation. Yeah. Other people want to respond? It makes me think about uh, <laughs> to be black in France. But <laughs> yes, because here what, what, what I, I, I see that is, is that you have the right to be specific, different. But in France, in fact, you don't really have, it's difficult to be different in, in, in France, in fact. It's difficult to be f black and French in France. In fact, uh, the, I, uh, this is my, my, my view, but in fact, well, when you're French, you have to be unique. In fact, you, you don't have to be specific. Uh, the, the, the specificity is not recogn recognized and it, it is... Uh, um, Despised. despised, in fact. So uh, we are still uh, struggle to say that yes, we are French, but we are different. We have a specific story, we have a specific vision of world, and we have specific uh, things to say. And uh, generally, in uh, French commissions or French uh, production, they when we. we you, you, we don't have really have a national French national representativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? <laughs> uh, uh, we don't see ourselves on French screens. We don't see ourselves on French stages of theater. And we are systematically like that uh, on, on the side. We are French, but on the side, and don't be, don't scream too loud, just don't be specific. So be French, there are one way to be French, and this is the way to be French. And we, we, we always like that to, uh, we, we don't feel very uh, welcomed. We are specificity, are not really re welcomed in, in French theater or, or not. This is, the, we are seen as, as folkloric things, but not, theater, <laughs> and it's difficult because we are st still uh, st st um, fighting to, to say we have a specific voice and it's a, why not a French specific voice? And uh, we want to, to write about these stories, these specific stories, because we have a, a, a story uh, with friends uh, and, and as friends don't really want to hear too loud about this slavery story or colonial stuff. Uh, we don't have to, to 
talk about that. And it's uh, uh, for certain playwrights or novelists, it's a, a, a fight. We fight uh, for, for that, to, to just to say a word, so to, to not to be in silence, but to say a word. It's difficult for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, being, I think, I, actually, I think it's changing now, but I certainly think that being black uh, when I was growing up was this very one thing. Um, so if you're if you're black, you have to know about these this kind of music, and you have to eat this kind of food, and you have to have this particular history. And if uh, and I know for me, I actually had to learn it because it wasn't in my family. So I had to kind of like, oh yeah, I totally know what what jazz is about, even though, like, and I know what um, like the South is about, even though I didn't. Um, so I was sort of uh, acting on a, on a certain level. Um, because I was too, I didn't want to, I, I just think that it used to be that if you were Caribbean and you dis distinguished yourself, it was perceived as, um, oh, you think you're actually better than us or, or something like that. <laughs> um, you're trying to be different. Um, Absolutely. Like that it, was it. In fact, yeah. it's like, well, no, I'm just trying to tell you, we just don't eat that food in my family. <laughs> like, yeah. we don't talk that way. I don't know. Um, I don't know why, but my black is not actually the same as your black, um, even though we're both black. So, uh, yeah, I think it's really hard. Yeah. And I think there's a benefit to being in New York, which is why I keep on coming back here. I was born here, but I keep coming back here because d there is a diverse community and everybody's claiming their ethnic truth. And I've lived in LA and you don't find Haitian food. And you got to struggle to find Jamaican food. Forget about, you know, you might not find any other cultural um, cuisine in some parts. And I've been to the South, and there, all of America is not owning the ethnic specificity. But if you're going to be in New York, <coughs> why not start the trend? You know what I mean? Do you think that uh, theater is actually a little bit behind mm -hmm. um, in terms of? representation and diverse forms of representation than film even. Uh, just when I think about the kind of theater that I'm seeing right now uh, and the kind, of, the kind of conversations that I hear in the theater community, it's um, very much privileges black American stories or Nigerian stories, <laughs> stories like, like African um, stories, but it's never Oh, you're Caribbean? Great. Uh, so I think there's a kind of flattening that happens when, when programming starts. Oh, we need a black voice, but actually it needs to be this very specific black voice that people can recognize and people understand. Uh, and we're not, we're not willing to deal with this story you know, like about Jamaica. Because again, Jamaicans, at least in my experience of theater, are like a joke. Um, yeah. Can we talk? Yeah, let's talk about this this idea of representation. Like, what roles are available to Caribbean women? I want to say, and now like Caribbean women players, Caribbean women actors. Like, what kind of roles are we seeing available for them, and what kind of representation do we see on stages and screens? If anybody wants to respond to that, and then how is your work pushing against that in any way? I mean, the one person who I was sort of like, wow, she's so amazing growing up that I knew of was Grace Jones. She was like the only, <laughs> the only Jamaican who was anybody um, in my view uh, of like, yeah. and since then I'm like, I don't even know who the Jamaicans are. Um, Ramola, I think I want you to jump in on this one. <laughs> I don't know that, I don't know that we have any standout figures like Grace Jones, like since, since her. Um, uh, you know, when, when I think about how women are represented in the stories in the films, I think, especially for the films that are made by women, there is, there is a, it's, the, the stories are nuanced, the characters are well developed. Um, you know, the stories are, they run the gamut from, uh, you know, there's a filmmaker in Barbados who made a film um, about a woman who is uh, queer, but a part of the spiritual Baptist mm -hmm. movement. And then how does she, she's like having this internal battle with wanting to be with, with another woman, but can't because of her religion. So it's like, that's, that's an example of a film. Then there's, there's another woman from Trinidad 
who made a film about her relationship with her father. And, you know, learning about him as a kid and growing up with him and then him passing and how she actually dealt with that entire process. So that's, that's another film. There's, there's another woman in, uh, in Trinidad again who is um, interested in preserving, like there is French Creole spoken in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And she's interested in preserving that. So she shot a whole film about a relative of hers who is like this old guy, he makes his own coffee. Like he literally has coffee trees in his backyard and he picks them and he dries them and then he grinds them and then he puts them in the pot and he makes coffee. She made a film about that. It was all in Creole um, as her attempt, you know, of preserving, preserving the language. So it's like, we're doing everything. We're doing, we're doing it all and the representation, the types of stories we tell, you know, just come from what our interests are. Yeah. And, and, and I think more and more women are finding their voices and wanting to share the, those, those stories. Yeah. So it looks like film is what we aspire to. <laughs> Caribbean film is what we're yeah, aspiring yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Well, in regards to how the Caribbean um, woman is portrayed in film and television in America, there was a, an indie film featuring Garcelle Beauvais. Um, she played a Haitian mother and a woman struggling as a single parent. And it was a textured character. The, lead, the, 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 sh the film was named after the lead character, which was the daughter. I recently went through the experience of being cast in a Netflix project as a Haitian mother. And they were adamant about casting Haitian people in the Haitian roles to speak the language. And so I feel that there is an awareness that you have to honor these unique characters with people who can actually convey the culture. And uh, so things are changing. Yeah. And each producer, each writer, each creative team that recognizes you can't do a blank stroke of what a Caribbean is. You have to say Haitian and stick to Haitian and hire someone who needs to, who has knows how to do the accent and speak the language. And if you're gonna say Trini, you have to find a Trini or someone who honors a Trini accent, not just some person who can do a derivation and butchers that culture's specificity. Um, so there is hope, absolutely. You just have to um, aspire to it and create the world where people are seeing you've got to be specific. Yeah. But like, meanwhile, um, <laughs> um, uh, I recently had a production um, of one of my plays that I didn't produce, it was like a theater produced it, and um, I had a character, um, two characters that were Jamaican in it, and um, one is, was an older, She's, she's like a grandmother character. She's a ghost, actually. She's a duppy. And um, she comes, and she's haunting her, her granddaughter, and she's like, you need to quit this job, basically. <laughs> basically, because her grandmother, I mean, her granddaughter is like a maid for an Upper East Side family. So, um, what was my point? Oh, so in the end of the play, there is a moment where the grandmother is on stage alone, and she's talking to the audience because she's the only one, because she's not alive, who can like break the fourth wall and talk to the audience. And she's telling this very solemn sort of story of her life. It's a quiet moment. And um, the director could not resist <laughs> um, underlaying her monologue with like this vague kind of Caribbean sort of music <laughs> that was not in the script. It was just like, oh, we're going to put music here. And had her dance all of a sudden, which is not in the script either, uh, and I kept sort of bringing it up like, I just don't understand why she's dancing here, like what's happening? Why is she, what is this moment um, that where she's dancing? And this is not Jamaican music also, uh, I just don't understand what's happening. Uh, and she was like, you don't like it, I love it. And so it was like kind of this battle where I was dealing with, and they were nice, but I was dealing with their own kind of perceptions of what being Caribbean is. And so they could not resist making it this kind of heartwarming, um, sort of weird calypso kind of thing, and, like, and having her dance and do this thing when, when actually the moment was not that at all. And it made her into a stereotype as opposed to a real person that she would actually take seriously. Um, so as I said, I think 
theater has a ways to go. <laughs> We're not there yet. Um, in terms yeah, well, of we got to be careful about who's producing the work, and you know, it's and and it's hard. It's hard. It is hard. You want to get yeah. it produced, um, and they it's don't. It's so hard because yeah. <laughs> it's very easy to be cast as that black woman who's difficult, and so you're trying to like you know, okay, it's all of us, and it's a communal effort, and we're, t like, and I get that, and I want you to be able to create, and also, um, it wasn't a thing where it was, a, like, they just paid me to, like, produce this play, so who am I to be like, no, <laughs> you can't produce my play, and don't pay me any money, so it, it's just, like, one of those, yeah. one of those negotiations where you're trying to kind of meet the needs of the moment, where, okay, uh, you're nice people, I understand what's happening here, I want to be a part of the team, however, I also want to remain, I want my story to remain my story, and I want it to have integrity, um, so they're just, you have to be brave enough to actually have those, I actually didn't even win that battle, they were, they just like kept, me. they just turned it down, and I was like, I just feel like it's so busy, the, this moment, there's so much happening, and I just want it to be quieter, and so they turned the music down. Yeah. Um, so they weren't like hearing me, but I tr I tried yeah. to. But it's, it sounds me. like the kind of they they basically put jobs in a sense jobs on this Caribbean female character, right? They have to be heartwarming, they have to dance, they have to perform for us, like all of these jobs. You that hear the sounds of the waves, exactly. So yeah, everyone knows that she's from so the island. So it's like this double, <laughs> yeah, this like exotic exotification of yeah. this woman and all of these like. Things, she has to make us feel good. Like that's her role, basically. And it's also a conversation of the woman's role in theater, right? Right. Should we just Quieter. be quiet? Yeah. And and just be grateful. Mm hmm. Danielle, I, I feel like I want you to jump in on this because in our conversation we talked a little bit about how you started writing work because of an absence that you were seeing in theater in Martinique for women's roles. Mm -hmm. Yes, and. Um and I, I raised in France, and uh, the only black model I have is what I was seeing on TV, and that it was Afro-African-Americans. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were my, my first model, but there were not models who, who are um, close to me. And that's also why I decided to, to write uh, stories, to, to represent also uh, women or my society or my, my specific issues. And uh, I forgot your, st your question. No, yeah, you, I, I remember in our conversation separately that we talked about the, like the, the last few plays that you wrote, you wrote because you felt that you weren't hearing women's voices in theater in Martinique. Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, we have a big, big uh, writer in Martinique. Is uh, Aimé Césaire. Aimé Césaire writes a, a lot of plays, some plays, but not really a lot of women characters. Not very strong women characters. And um, Edouard Glissant also. I don't really have souvenir of a big, strong women characters. Um, perhaps in contemporary theater, there are more f female uh, characters, uh, like in uh, Luc saint plays, we plays, we have women. And uh, yes, I, I think that there are specific stories, specific f things that women only, perhaps only women can, can tell. Uh, and uh, that's why also I decided to, 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 to I don't know if I decided it was like that. I was I had to <laughs> I had to to write down s certain stories, and um, uh, I I wanted also to represent um, like in my last play La Diablesse, uh, strong women, because when we see women, they are also they are problems. They are weak. They are, they have social problems or so violence problem. And I wanted to, 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 to write down this play because uh, for me, La Diablesse is a sort of superhero, hero, female superhero, Caribbean superhero. <laughs> that was, uh, I wanted to write it down because the, it's it based about a, a, a legend uh, who in, in the Caribbean, but not uh, the only. And uh, it's, it's about a, a, a 
magic creature, female creature who is very seducing. And uh, when you are men, be careful because she's so seducing that she will uh, take you in the woods and uh, the, the, the morning after, the day after, you could be lost or mad or dead. <laughs> and this is about, um, this ca came to me about, uh, from uh, uh, oral tradition from my grandmother or people. And uh, I was asking my young uh, fellows, uh, female fellows, about La Diablesse. Do you know La Diablesse? And nobody knows about uh, La Diablesse. So I decided also to write it down to, to, to um, transmit, to convey. to convey this tradition, oral tradition, about that strong, magical woman who is, who is in a um, uh, heritage and uh, oral heritage. And um, I wanted to show them <laughs> a woman who are like them and who is uh, strong and not a, a broke woman. And, uh, sh <laughs> and, uh, and I, want, I wanted to talk about men also and uh, my vision of certain male uh, in our society and a certain educa education they give to male to be uh, seducing women and collecting human, women and uh, take women, the bodies of women. And I wanted to, 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 create, to create this, uh, this uh, super hero, hero to, uh, to be strong enough to say, to say to the men, stop, no, my body is not yours. I decide when, what I decide for my body. You don't take my body like that. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, and, and this character was important for me, for my personal story, but also to, to, to convey this tradition about uh, this woman. And also because we, have in, we are in a modern society where all uh, young people are on their phones and they don't really have nowhere they can, they can uh, receive their story or their heritage. No, uh, on the TV, no, in f no they, they, have, they don't have um, uh, the, the moyens de, de, re compliqué. The moyens de recevoir, mm -hmm. the, the means to receive their er oral heritage who is disper dis disparaging, disappearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was um, important for me to write down this story. Yeah. We'll discover this the tomorrow night. So basically, yeah. Reaching into our past to find strong, strong models that we could follow that yeah. our younger generation can mm -hmm. look up to yeah. um, to talk about that empowerment of women. Yeah. So I think now we might open it up to the audience for questions or comments. Ah, yeah. I might borrow somebody's mic. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I am happy to be here, and I found out at the last minute, uh, though I am in New York, so it's difficult for us to really get together, but you know, this is so important, what we're doing here today. Um, I wanted to just let you know that St. Lucia, we know about La Jablesse also. Yes, yes, I know that. So, <laughs> so it cuts across the stories. We might have different names for the characters, but the essence of the character, Jamaica has the version, there's Nanny, who was a real person, so all of that. So we do have the stories. So you know, it's 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 interesting that this is so passionate for you and so important to you. And um, likewise, everyone's trying to get all those stories across. But at the end of the day, the specific is important. But the universal side of it, because we all can relate as humans, and the, the other people who are not specific Caribbean or who are not black, they need to understand our story also, so we need to bear that in mind. So I appreciate that we're collaborating so the stories can get wider audiences and, and bigger. So thanks for this opportunity to be here. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, in fact, I have uh, one question uh, for Daniele. Um, when you work I guess your work has been presented in, uh, in Martinique um, or in Guadeloupe as well. How, what was the impact on the audience? I mean, if you, 
you were you are speaking of uh, domestic violence or the position of women in the in um, in Guadeloupe. So how was it received? What was the reaction of the audience? Um, the impact. Very often, people tell me that I write necessary plays. There are necessary subjects, uh, issues to write down, because we we don't we have there there are some 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 play about 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 violence, but I don't know. There are a lot of women who come to and weep in my arms after that, or women who write down some words for me uh, that are tell me thank you for uh, talking for us. Uh, I'm uh, emu, and I, I'm, I'm really mo moved, moved about about that because uh, I'm, um, I discover that uh, my my personal work, that that, that is the personal vision, uh, can touch a lot of women, and it's a, a sort of voice of several uh, several women. And uh, that issues are very important for uh, hurricanes about incest, but also when I presented uh, La Diablesse, uh, women tell, tell me also, thank you for us, because uh, in fact they, they, they felt very empowered and, uh, and strong and uh, uh, fier, brave, proud to be what they are. Mm. Mm. What questions? Yeah. Um, th this, this is a question that has to do with production and something that I've been thinking about all the time that I've been working on French theater and Francophone theater and American theater and where the money comes from mm -hmm. and why that might have some difficulty, make things more difficult for Danielle, mm -hmm. for example, to get her work done because in uh, France, including in Guadeloupe and Martinique, for the most part, theater is subsidized by the government. Mm -hmm. So of course everyone loves this, right? Because the government believes in arts, it's France, so art is great and so on and so forth. But it means that work that's outside of the mainstream doesn't get produced very often. Mm -hmm. And people don't have the habit, you, you've all gone out and looked for money, right? You've gone and found money and you've made it happen. But there isn't a kind of culture of doing that, I think, in the francophone world, in the francophone sphere. And I'm, I'm just pointing that out, because where do you get produced, Dan uh, Danielle? Uh, yeah, my, my work was produce, produced by the um, French, uh, alors le, le Bureau de la Drate en Martinique, le Bureau du Ministère de the direction of cultural there are affairs, in regional, regional direction of cultural affairs. And uh, and um, they are obliged. They have. they have to <laughs> produce my work because we are not a lot in companies, and I and uh, and uh, and I discuss a lot with them to to pour les convaincre, to convince that it's important to do it. But in uh, in 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 France itself. But in France, it's not the same thing. I think Luc, Luc can talk about that. In France, it's not the same thing. Uh, I, am, I live in Martinique and I create in Martinique. It's not the same thing that in France. In France, um, it's very, very, very hard. We have to find money other ways. I mean, and I'll add that living in New York, even though technically, well, that arts are subsidized by, I guess we'll call them czars, people who have money and doing very like specific stories like the rest of us are, who are in New York, it's the same thing. So yeah, just pointing that out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Vanessa. I'm originally from French Guiana. I used to work with Nicole from the French Embassy and we invited Daniele in, in Miami. So I know her play Hurricane, which is very strong. I just wanted to make a, a brief comment actually on um, uh, about the Caribbean community, you know, because right now I'm working on another project which is more on immigrants. And it happens that actually the Caribbean community, which probably some people or maybe all of you know, but 
um, is the second largest uh, community after the Asian one in New York, which means after Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, and so on. So it's the second largest community in New York, and I feel in terms of opportunities, um, this is huge, and we have to kind of seize this opportunity and get together, as you said, and work um, as a network. It's not always easy, but I think many different actions and initiatives have been taken in that sense. Um, probably more in visual arts, there have been a couple of um, exhibitions in that sense, less in the, on, the, um, on theater, so I'm really um, glad this is happening. So I think this is, um, in terms of impact, and outreach and audience, um, this is um, quite significant, and I think we, we can build on that. Thank but you. I think you need to recognize that the Caribbean community um, doesn't feel a theater serves their interest. So first you have to tell them that there is theater that will interest them. Um, and that hasn't been the case in New York or anywhere else in America. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think um, it's really tricky when you talk about, I don't, it's not even so much Caribbean communities as immigrant communities, right? Immigrant so because, communities. Um, generally speaking from my experience, um, immigrants are all about like working and, <laughs> and like surviving and um, assimilating and not really sticking out and particularly at least when I was growing up and I mean that's shifting now. Um, I think you're right. I think there is a wealth of opportunity. Um, but I guess the questions that we need to continue to ask are, well, how do you, how do you um, pre present a case to various communities and say, no, this is actually for you. These are stories um, that, that were made specifically for you um, that, that has some value. Um, so you, sh you know, maybe you'd be willing to pay $10 or whatever it is to like come see something rather than saving that money for groceries or saving that money for, do you know, <laughs> like I think it's really, really challenging. I mean, when I think about the Asian, I only know of one um, Asian theater, the Mai Rep, or, or, I think it's Mai, um, the Mai Theater, the Mai theater Company. Company. Uh, that's the one I know. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot about Pan Asian. Um, I don't know of a Caribbean theater company in New York. Oh, yeah. Conch Shell Productions, yeah. me. Yeah, from last year, so this is new. <laughs> so it's very new and yeah. it's very grassroots. So last year, in preparation for Hear Her Call, I went to senior centers, I contacted high schools, and so this year I'm gonna be working on getting volunteers because we're being hosted by York College they, the Milton G. Basin Performing Arts Center is co-presenting our festival. So I'm going to be looking for volunteers to go into the community, to speak to the community, to speak to high school students, to encourage them to come because one of the most passionate members of our audience were a group of high school students from a neighboring, uh, from a Hillcrest High School, which is my alma mater. Oops, I put it out there. And they were pumped. They were like shouting and applauding and they, they were active participants in the post-show discussion because they were excited that, oh my gosh, that's my story. That's exactly how my mother talks to me. That's what it's like in my household because we had two pieces about, you know, the Caribbean American child and the Caribbean parent and the battle for power and what's true, what's the true way to be. So it's very grassroots. Yeah, and but I'd also add that there is actually a very long history of Caribbean American theater. Unfortunately, though, it tends to happen in small, small communities, and so that the, their names don't get to carry on past the community that birthed them. Rasa so, Productions. Rasa Productions. Nandi Kay, who is going to moderate one of the panel discussions uh, this evening. E. Wayne McDonald, who's been doing theater in New York, I don't know, maybe over 30 years. Liberation, um, the Liberation Theater is headed by a Jamaican-American woman, Sandra E. Daly. There Sharif. we go. Yeah, and so, so there's actually quite a lot. Yeah, there's a long history. Cheryl Byron is an, also another name that's very prominent in um, the Caribbean-American community in terms of performance and theater and music and dance. And there's actually the Caribbean-American Theater in Queens. There you go. They've been around a very, very long time. Yeah, so um, there is a lot. It's just that... Again, opportunities like these don't happen very often. And so unless you're in the small community that births it and the slightly larger community that attends those events, 
the names don't get to carry on. So thank you for being here. Last question. Thank you all for um, sharing uh, thus far. Um, I'm interested in uh, these narratives um, and uh, what you had mentioned earlier about being a role model um, and how, uh, and to kind of also uh, segue to Candace's question on preservation of your work uh, in how you would like to be archived. How do you imagine your, uh, uh, your contributions that you've made thus far and that you intend to make going forward? Um, what is the unique way you want your work to be disseminated beyond yourself um, through an institution, through, independ through independently. Um, how do you want to library yourself if, um, uh, for, for those going forward? Uh, I mean, I definitely think keep, it's important. We keep this last comment brief because yeah. we have to transition. So. OK, I definitely think it's important uh, for plays to be published. Uh, because that gives colleges an opportunity to buy them and uh, disseminate them to their students. I think that plays should be studied the same way other forms of literature are studied. So people should write papers about plays uh, and give them that kind of academic um, credibility. Not to say that that the be all end all, but I find it helpful. Um, I also I also write children's theater sometimes, and I think it's really great uh, to get them while they're young um, and get them ex <laughs> get them excited about theater. Um, so reaching younger audiences to me is like a great way to continue the work. And they're theater journals. I've had one of my pieces published in the theater journal, and it's gonna another piece is gonna be published in the theater journal. So they're journals for the academic world. Um, it's out there. You just have to decide to find it. Yeah. You know. Ramola, you want to talk briefly? Yeah. Um, you know, there's for, for film specifically, I don't believe that there is an archive um, for Caribbean films. Um, I've, I've been speaking to a filmmaker who made a film in Guyana, I don't know, in the 70s. It's still on 16 millimeter. We showed it at BAM on the 16 millimeter because they have one theater with that capability. But her, her first question to me when, 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 when we spoke about showing the film is, is there an archive? Like, where, what can I, I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm moving on. Where can I leave my work? Mm. Um, <laughs> where it will be kept intact and, and so it, it can be enjoyed and we don't have one. So, you know, that, that is a huge gap that we need to sort of work on. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's the problem of theater in general, right? Because it's like an ephemeral thing. You know, it's this live event. So, how do you archive it? Yeah. It's, a, it's a good question. Beyond publication, which is not actually the same, like reading something is not the same experience of, sort of, you know, seeing something and hearing something. But yeah. mm -hmm. Danielle, you want to say any last? Quick um, words? None of my none of my plays are published. So for me, for me, the first the first time the first thing is to pu publish them. To this this one will be <laughs> and in english and um, and the, and the other play hurricanes will be tra traduced in czech translated it in in czech in fact the first uh, audiences that are interested in my in my uh, in my work are foreign audi audiences and the publishers and uh, it's a, it's good for me to 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 uh, to uh, exchange exchange about my about my work here in uh, in uh, America and in uh, other countries of uh, of Europe is like that. Um, also, New Play Exchange. It's a website where writers can get their work posted on that site, and there's also opportunities to get published because there are calls from different publishers for new works. They focus on new works, so just go to newplayexchange.org, and it's a membership organization, but they were at TCG this summer, and they're doing great things for new writers, and they do have a lot of Caribbean American writers' work. There was actually an article about Caribbean American writers. Nice. I think we're going to wrap it up. Last question. Okay, go. So the Caribbean Writer still exists. They are published at the University of Virgin Islands. 
um, and it's been around maybe 30, 35 years now, The Caribbean Writer, which is a, um, um, it comes out yearly publication and it has poetry, short stories, and theater plays as well, published in the, in the, in the magazine or in the book, in the journal. Um, and then Opal Palmer Adisa, who is a writer out of Jamaica, has an online magazine called Interviewing the Caribbean. N recently, um, maybe it's about three years old, and that's another opportunity for publishing. And lastly, a comment about play or Caribbean theater being produced here in New York. Don't forget, Puerto Rican theater is majorly, majorly produced here. And a lot of times when conversations about the Caribbean happen, Puerto Rico is left out of that conversation. Um, either by them, they exclude themselves or we exclude the non um, Puerto Rican Caribbean, exclude Puerto Rico in our conversations about what is Caribbean. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think on that note, we're going to end. I just want to do a brief bio read of each of the panelists, just to have that on record before we leave. Magali is a first generation Haitian American actress, playwright, director, producer, who was born in Brooklyn, New York in 2018. She became the founder and artistic director of Kong Shell Productions. Ramola O. Lucas is an attorney and avid Caribbean indie film enthusiast of Guyanese heritage who resides in Brooklyn, New York. She's a founder and executive director of Caribbean Film Academy, a New York based nonprofit created to share Caribbean films. And Amina Henry, her recent productions include The Animals, Ducklings, Hunter John and Jane, and The Johnsons at Jack, and she's a playwright and educator, all right? And Daniele Francisque, of course, who is here, our honored guest. You will see her work, La Jablesse, tomorrow at 8 p.m. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. We're gonna transition. Yes, the next thing will start at 4 p.m. Thank you.